Well, some of you, if you've been following along over the last uh, number of weeks, you've, you've probably noticed a bit of a trend. You've probably noticed that a number of our background readings lately have come from the book of Revelation. And I'm going to continue that pattern uh, today. And I think you'll, you'll realize that the connection is, is obvious. This is another one of these passages that actually just highlights the way in which the whole larger story of the Bible is, is woven together from Genesis through Exodus, ultimately to the book of Revelation. And so I'd like to read with you from Revelation 5, the verses 6 through 14. There we hear God's word. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Well, we're gonna continue our series uh, from the book of Exodus this morning, uh, picking things up in Exodus chapter 12, but before we do that, I want to pray that God would also bless the reading of his word, the preaching of his word, and the application of his word to our hearts, that it would bear fruit for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that this morning we get to gather and to sit under the instruction of your holy word. This morning we come together to hear you speak for you to confront us with the reality of who you are, your claim on our lives, the promises that you offer, and the fulfillment of those promises in Jesus Christ. Father, would you help us to be in awe? Would you help us to walk away today with a sense of your glory, that as we think about the lamb who was slain, that we would be like the elders in heaven, that we would fall to our knees that we would worship. Lord, would you have that impact on our lives through your word, by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'd like to read Exodus 12, uh, the first 13 verses with you. Exodus 12, the first 13 verses. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, And you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. In this manner, you shall eat it 
with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So far the reading of God's holy word. Well, next month will mark 16 years since Hurricane Katrina devastated uh, the city of New Orleans. Some of you uh, may actually remember this event. It was a storm that had an incredibly widespread impact. I believe almost 600,000 people were initially left homeless. It was a storm that started uh, just kind of like a, a, like a regular tropical storm, and as it, as it kind of came across the Gulf of Mexico, it, it grew and it kind of gathered in, in size and it became bigger and bigger until the point where it reached a Category 5 hurricane. Now, about 80% of the city of New Orleans is actually built below sea level, and so it's, it's surrounded uh, by these, these, these levees, kind of by these, these dams, which are intended to keep the storm waters out in, in, in the event of, of one of these storms, in, in the event of one of these storm surges. But as this particular storm kind of bore down upon the city, they began to realize that they were in trouble. And so these mandatory evacuation notices went out and people were told to grab a few things and to flee because they realized that the dams, that the levees were not going to hold. Sadly, many people still lost their lives because they thought that they could face the storm. They weren't willing to leave behind their homes. They weren't willing to leave behind their possessions. They were not willing to heed the warning. And in the end, they paid the ultimate price. And I think that that's maybe how we should imagine what's going on in our passage today. Because for the last number of chapters, a a storm has been brewing. God has been sending plague after plague after plague upon the land of Egypt. And each one and each one has been bigger and it's been more serious than the plague which came before. And so Moses and Aaron are going to Pharaoh and they're going to the Egyptians. And they're warning them, and they're warning them because they know that the eye of the storm is approaching. They know that on this night, the judgment of God is going to come sweeping across the land of Egypt, and it is going to impact everyone. The Egyptians will not be spared the judgment of God, but I want you to notice that the Israelites would not be spared either, unless unless they were covered by the blood of the Lamb. See, this passage today is really about the gospel according to Exodus. This is a passage which gives us a sobering reminder about the wrath of God against sin, and it is a stark warning about the reality, the reality of a coming judgment. A judgment that all of us will face, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, all of us will stand before the judgment seat of God to give an account. And and if we think that we are fine simply because we're a member of a church, this passage is also a tremendous wake-up call. But it's also a passage that offers hope. It's a passage that offers hope because it reminds us that God has provided a way of safety. God has provided a way to be saved. And that is for us as individuals to, to flee and to seek salvation under the protection of the blood of the Lamb. And so what I want to do this morning is really just kind of preach the gospel uh, according to Exodus. And I want us to think about the significance uh, of the blood of the Lamb 
And I want to touch on, on three things as I go through this. The fact that the blood of the Lamb should define our lives. The fact that the blood of the Lamb should bring us together. And then finally, that the blood of the Lamb should call us to action. Those three things, starting with this, the blood of the Lamb should define our lives. As we get into our text today, um, Moses and Aaron, they have just finished warning Pharaoh and the Egyptians about this final plague. This plague that is going to result in the death of every firstborn child and every firstborn animal in the land of Egypt. It, it, is, it is a terrible plague, and it is certainly a result of God's wrath coming down upon the Egyptians for a number of things, for the way in which they have, they have spurned and defied him, for the way in which they have afflicted and oppressed God's people, and for some of the horrific evils that they have done. If you think back to chapter 1, you have to remember that Pharaoh... And the Egyptians were all part of this endeavor to take the Israelite boys and, and to throw these children to drown them in the Nile River. And Pharaoh and the Egyptians thought that they could do these things without any repercussions, without any consequences. And here, after many warnings, God is finally going to bring them to their knee. He's going to show them the extent of his power. But before he does... He pauses. All the other plagues, as you go through seven, chapters 7 through 11, they come one after the other, after the other, after the other. But with this final plague, God pauses, and he calls the Israelites to celebrate something called the Passover. Now, the Passover was, you should understand it as a meal of faith. It was this meal where they would take this lamb, they would sacrifice it as we read, and they would take the blood of the lamb and they would put it on the doorposts of their home so that on this night, when God's judgment swept across the land, when, when God saw the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, his judgment would pass over that particular home. And by partaking in this meal, the Israelites were demonstrating that they took God's warning seriously. And they were demonstrating that they believed the promises of God that they would be protected by the blood of the Lamb. This was such a significant night and such a significant event that God actually wanted it to define their lives. Tonight they were going to see an incredible act of God's saving power. They were going to see God rescue them for good. This event was going to mark the end of an old life and the beginning of a new life. And so God wanted this to be a defining moment. That's why he says in verse 2, he says, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. God says this event is so big that I actually, I, I want it to mark the beginning of your calendar year. This is so big that your lives are never going to be the same. God says the Israelites, that your, your history is going to be divided into two parts. There's going to be the life of slavery and there's going to be the life of freedom. Your history is going to be divided into the life before the exodus and the life after the exodus. And this Passover meal was going to be a constant reminder that pointed them back to God's grace and God's mercy. And they were going to need that because the journey ahead was going to be hard, and it was easy for them to lose perspective. And I think we all, we all know what this is like when, when, when you're in a, in a difficult situation and, and, and you struggle to keep that perspective. I was thinking about a time about 20 years ago or so, my, my brother and I went with a friend and we traveled to the country of Peru. And we, we did this five-day hike through the Andes because we wanted to see the ruins of Machu Picchu, which are one of the, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But this hike took us way up in the Andes to elevations of about 15 and a half to 16,000 feet. And so when we got to the, like some of those higher passes near the mountaintop, the air became quite thin and, and your breathing actually became pretty labored. And the journey suddenly became very, very difficult. So we had this guide with us and what he would do is he would have us go in like 300 foot increments. We would hike for about 300 feet 
Then we would pause, we would sit down, we would rest. We'd have a bite to eat. We'd have a quick drink. And then we'd be back up. And we'd go another 300 feet. And we'd stop, we'd eat, we'd drink. And we'd go on. And those moments of rest were actually beautiful, beautiful moments. Because in those moments, you would actually take everything in. And on the one hand, you, you would look up at the mountaintop and you'd realize that you were still a long way from where you wanted to be. But you could also look back and be incredibly thankful that you were a long way from where you once were. And, and I think that we ought to live the Christian life with some of that perspective. Because on our journey, as we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, there are times where the journey is hard. And there are times where we need to pause and to rest and to eat and to drink and to be strengthened. Which is, which is exactly what Christ has given us in the Lord's Supper. If you're familiar with the story of the Bible, then you know that about 2,000 years ago, there was another storm that was brewing. And God's wrath was going to be poured out against sin. It was a judgment that we could say would have swept us all away. Except in this instant, Jesus Christ came. And he sacrificed himself and he put himself directly in the path of the eye of the storm. That's exactly what he was doing on the cross. It's why the prophet Isaiah describes him as a lamb who was led to the slaughter. And yet before Jesus Christ went to the cross, the night before, he paused with his disciples in the upper room and he sat down and they celebrated the Passover. And not only did they celebrate the Passover, but Jesus there, he transformed it into something new. He transformed it into, into the Lord's Supper and he commanded the disciples and he commands us to do this in remembrance of him. Because the Lord's Supper now commemorates for us as Christians the defining moment, the defining event in the history of the world. It is a meal that commemorates the ultimate act of God's saving power. It's a meal that commemorates God rescuing people and redeeming people for good. The Lord's Supper commemorates the end of the old life and the beginning of a new life. It commemorates the end of slavery and the beginning of freedom for all those who trust in the blood of the Lamb. For all those who trust in Jesus Christ, the Lord's Supper marks the beginning of, of, of an entirely new life and a journey to the promised land. But as I said, we know that journey is difficult. And we know that it can be hard. And it's easy to lose perspective. And so Jesus, in the Lord's Supper, offers us times regularly where we can pause, where we can rest, where we can eat, where we can drink, where we can be strengthened. And that's what we're going to do next week. And when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's almost as if Jesus sits down with us and he and he offers us these beautiful, encouraging words where he says, it's, it's true, as you look ahead, you are still a long way from where you want to be. But if you look back, you can also thank God that you're a long way from where you once were. Because we're, we're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer slaves to death. We've been freed. We've been redeemed. We've been rescued for good. We're on a journey to the promised land. We have a new life. And it's all through the blood of the Lamb. So the blood of the Lamb should define our lives. Secondly, the blood of the Lamb should bring us together. If you look at the verses 3 through 9, God begins to describe in, in incredibly fine detail exactly how the Passover should be celebrated. Now, I don't have time to get into into all of the, the minute details today, what I wanted to do was just draw out the, the emphasis in this section on, on the fact that this was a communal meal. 
This, this was a meal that God wanted the Israelites to enjoy together. He says to Moses and Aaron in, in verse 2, he, or sorry, verse... I forget which verse, but he says it. He says, tell all the congregation of Israel, tell the whole congregation to take a lamb. And if the household wasn't big enough to eat a whole lamb... Then he says that you're to share it together with another household. Right? So if you, don't, if you can't eat a whole lamb by yourself, well, then you, you share it with another family or some other individuals, and, and collectively you share a lamb. He says it's to be a lamb without blemish, a male, a year old. They were to keep it until the 14th day of the month. And then I, 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 he says the whole assembly again, he stresses this. God says the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. They would do this together, and then they would take some of the blood of the lamb, and they would put it on the doorposts on their home. Now again, there's just this strong emphasis in this section on the fact that this was a communal meal. This this was a meal which God intended for them to enjoy together. And, And I don't know that we have a great parallel in our day. The closest I could think of was something like Thanksgiving. I I remember about nine years ago when we moved from BC to Ontario. We'd only been here for a couple of months and then it was already uh, it was already Thanksgiving, but we didn't actually have any family in this province. We we didn't really have any friends. We were we were just so new and so our first Thanksgiving was a bit weird because our kids were very very small and so there was no way that we were going to eat a whole turkey uh, together. But there was this, there, there was this woman in, in our church, and she was kind of on her own, and she obviously was not going to be able to eat a turkey on her own. And so what she did was she would actually look around the church, and she would pick people who were kind of in a similar stage, people who were kind of like, like us. And then she would, invite, she would invite them to her home and you would just, you'd all enjoy a meal together. And so that's what happened. We, we ended up at this home. We're all around the table, this random assortment of people. And in the middle, there's this big, there's this big old turkey. And, and it's, one of the, it's one of those beautiful memories that I have, not just because we, we, we enjoyed and we shared a common meal, but because what brought us together, what we enjoyed and shared was also a common faith. And I think that's how we have to imagine the Passover. The Passover for the Israelites wasn't just about sharing a common meal. It was was about coming together and enjoying and sharing a common faith. And at the heart of it all was this Passover lamb. Because it was through the lamb that God had provided them with a way of salvation. The truth is that the Israelites were not better than the Egyptian. We can never lose sight of that. God's clear about that in Deuteronomy 7, that that there wasn't anything particularly special about the Israelites. And if you look simply at their history, you know that they were were often shallow, self-centered, they were vindictive, they were judgmental, they could be self-centered, hard-hearted, they often grumbled and complained against God. They were a people with all sorts of flaws. And so in order to appease his judgment, God wanted a sacrifice that was not. That's why God asked them, to sacrifice a lamb without blemish, a lamb without flaw, in the place of people who were so flawed and blemished. The Passover was intended to be a picture, a reminder of the need for an imperfect people to have a perfect substitute. And the reason that this meal brought all the Israelites together is because they shared a common problem. And they shared a common need. They needed God to provide salvation through the blood of the Lamb. That is what brought them together. And that's also what still brings us together. Every Sunday when we come together for worship, we come together as imperfect people. We're not not better than other people in this parking lot. We're not better than other people across the road. 
when we actually look at our own lives, we often see ourselves as being vindictive, shallow, angry, bitter. We can be self-centered, we can be hard-hearted, and we often grumble and complain against God. We are an imperfect people who need a perfect substitute to take our place. And God has provided that substitute in Jesus Christ. See, the Passover lamb was ultimately always pointing to Jesus, the lamb who was slain. This is exactly what scripture teaches. You think of John the Baptist as he's baptizing people by the Jordan River in John chapter 1. As he sees Jesus approaching, what does he say? He says, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so next week when we're celebrating Lord's Supper, we're not just coming together to enjoy a common meal and to share a common meal. What's, what's bringing us together is that we share a common faith and a common need for the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper is intended to be, to be a picture that points us forward to heaven. It points us forward to, to, to the, the marriage feast of the Lamb described in Revelation 19 where, where all God's people from all times and all places will come together. All those who, as the Apostle Peter says, have been ransomed. Not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish or spot. One day, when we stand in glory, we will all be brought together. And the one thing that brings us together will be the blood of the lamb. So the blood of the lamb should define our lives. It should bring us together. And finally, it should call us to action. When you look at verse 10 and verse 11, God speaks of the Passover and he says, you shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. One of the things that I have never realized when thinking about the Passover was that it's basically described as an eat and run. When you look through those verses, it's very interesting that God says, "Don't, don't save any leftovers. You don't get to pack anything up for the road. You are just to come in, keep your sandals on, keep that belt done up tight, staff in your hand, eat, and be ready to run. I think, okay, well, why? Well, I think because God wanted to remind the Israelites that they had a long way to go. Yes, on this night, they were going to witness God's redeeming power. They were going to witness God saving them for good. It was the end of an old life and the beginning of a new life. But Egypt wasn't their home. Egypt was not the final destination. Instead, God had an inheritance in store for them. God had this promised land that he was calling them to go to. He was calling them to to take this journey, to make his glory known in all the ends of the earth. And as they celebrated the Passover, that's where he wanted their focus to be. And I would say that's where God wants our focus to be as well. Because as Christians, we are also on a journey. And we are on a journey to make the glory of God known throughout all the earth. And there's a real danger that we can lose sight of that. There's a real danger that we can actually get so comfortable and so relaxed that we get so settled in that we're actually not ready to go where God calls us to go and to do what God calls us to do. I was reading a book this past week uh, by David Platt called Radical Together. It's kind of a a challenging and yet an enjoyable read uh, to think through what it means to be the church. 
And I've been familiar with David Platt's ministry for some time. I've, I've listened to a number of his messages, but one of the things that I, I never realized was that his family was one of the families that lost everything in Hurricane Katrina. Their home was one of the many homes that was just completely submerged. And in this book, he, he kind of describes what it was like to lose everything. He, he talks about how he was kind of confused in the questions that came. I mean, he'd been a, a seminary uh, professor in New Orleans, and now after Hurricane Katrina, he had no idea when his life was going to get back to normal. But over time, he also talks about how he realized that this experience of losing all of his earthly possessions. It was also a reminder of, of the cost, of the price that Christians need to be prepared to pay when they follow Jesus. And it leaves us with some difficult questions. Right? If, if, if I were to lose everything, am I okay? If everything that I have is gone and all I have left is Jesus, am I fine? Right? The reality is that in this life, everything that we've built up, everything that we've accrued, all of our possessions, everything we own, at some point it is going to be swept away and the only thing we're going to be left with is the treasure that we've stored up in heaven the inheritance which God has in store for us. It's important for us to remember that. We need to wrestle with these questions as individuals, but we also need to wrestle with them as a church. Because the truth is that we all tend to get comfortable. I tend to get comfortable. And we easily forget that, that we are on a journey. And I think that's why the Lord's Supper is a regular call to action. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are reminded that Christ is our life. When we partake in the Lord's Supper, we, we are declaring that Christ is, is my food, Christ is my drink, Christ is my strength, Christ is my wisdom, Christ is my salvation, Christ is my treasure. And through him, I have everything that I need. And so let's remember that next week as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Right? It is, it is a beautiful, beautiful time, and it's a beautiful meal. But it is also an eat and run. Because we're not at the final destination. We're on a journey. A journey to see the Lamb who was slain. And on this journey, we as the people of God are called to pursue the purpose of God. To preach and teach the word of God. To make known the son of God. To show the love of God. All with the single purpose of making known the glory of God. May we do that. May we do that. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that when we come to your word, we have pictures of your grace and of your kindness from the opening pages all the way through to the closing pages of Scripture. We are reminded of the inheritance that you have in store for those who love you and who trust in your promises. And we look forward to the day when we will encounter the Lamb who was slain, when we will see him face to face, when we will realize what it is to have you be our God, to have you dwell with us, to know what it is to truly be your people. That moment where all our imperfections and all of our flaws will be washed away and we will be presented perfect, righteous, purified and made holy by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Help us 
to realize that everything we have is bound up in him. And help us to be prepared to leave everything behind in order to follow our Savior and to live for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.